Um, cool. So you might have uh, heard of this, this story. Anybody hear about the, the Hornets out in Washington? Yeah. Crazy. You know, we were talking earlier in the semester about um, the three biggest threats uh, to biodiversity. Do you remember what they were? Yeah, that was one of them. Yeah. And, and what were the other two? Yep, habitat destruction and direct exploitation were the other two. But one of them <coughs> was introduced species. Uh, and so kind of a, a crazy uh, situation here. Um, they, uh, these these uh, hornets came over from Asia. They're about two inches long. And um, they're most concerning. Does anybody know why they're most concerning to us? Yeah, they kill they kill honeybees. They they decapitate them. They <laughs> the these 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 hornets go to the bee nests, the beehives, and then um, kill the whole colony, and then take the bee larvae and bring them back to feed them uh, to their baby hornets. Uh, but it's interesting. I was I was reading. It turns out you know so honeybees here have never seen these things, so they don't have any defense for them. But uh, honeybees in Asia, it turns out, uh, are able to, to, to fight these things off. When they come into their nest, the honeybees all gather around them and they, they make like a ball around the hornet and they beat their wings really fast and they increase the temperature really high to where these things can't survive and they actually suffocate them that way by making like a, a bee ball essentially around the hornets. But of course, our, uh, our honeybees here haven't, uh, haven't adapted to that at all. So uh, why, why are honeybees really important? Pollination. Pollination, yeah. So they're, they're, they're pollinators. So the, the threat then is that like, if we lose our honeybee populations, that then all of the flowering plants, which are dependent on honeybees to move the pollen from one to the other, won't be able to reproduce. Um, there's actually a little short video I, I thought I might share. Let me see if I can pull it up real quick. But the ultimate irony of this is, does anybody know where our honeybees come from, the ones that live in the hives? Europe. They actually come from Europe. So what we think of as our like native honeybees were actually brought here from Europe. So 90, you know, 99% of the bees that you see flying around, what we think of as like honeybees, uh, are in fact non-native themselves. They're brought from Europe. So we do have native bees in North America, uh, but they're, they're ground nesting bees. So they're bees that they have their nests in the ground. And they're a lot smaller. Uh, and they've been, um, they've been hit really hard by agriculture because when you plow the land, it destroys the nests. So um, our native North American bees uh, are, are, are not doing well at all. The honeybees that came from Europe are what we rely on for most of our pollination now. But, um, Hopefully they'll be safe from this honeybee uh, menace, if you will. But there was a, there's one video I saw in here. Let's see if I can find it. It details this this story. Um, how do I want to do this? Hornet. Hornet invasion. There we go. Um, yeah, I think this is the one that I want. Uh, I forget which video it was that I saw. Well, this will <laughs> this video will, will tell the story. So, uh, the news today from Washington State. It came in a statement of two words. So, they found these things in Washington State. Uh, and then you need an ecologist. So the ecologists uh, came to the rescue. Was that volume too loud? Let's go down a little bit. So this will tell the story a little bit about it. Got him. Today, federal agriculture authorities destroyed a murder hornet nest, releasing <laughs> these images showing dozens of the invasive insects trapped inside that long, clear tube. The nest of Asian giant hornets, an invasive species, was the first ever found in the United States. 
The two-inch insects are called murder hornets because they're predators of valuable honeybees. They were tracked with a tiny transmitter attached with dental floss. Yeah, so when they saw these things, they had to figure out how to, uh, you know, how to, how, how, to get to the, um, how to get to the nest. So they did this kind of interesting thing where they, they attached um, little tracking devices with dental floss. So the hornet that you saw in the picture there was eating this jelly. And so as it was sitting there eating it, they used dental floss to attach this tracking device to it. And the first couple they attached them to, these, the, the tracking devices fell off. But then they finally got one that they were able to follow back to its nest um, and find out where its nest was. And um, yeah, and so then they came and they like, they like wrapped the nest all in plastic and then used like a vacuum thing to like suck all of the hornets out of it. And uh, hopefully there are no more around. Although one of the things we've learned with non-native species is that it's really hard to get rid of them once they find their way to a place that they can survive. So. Um, so we'll see. Anyway, they actually are not, I mean, they're, they're, it's not pleasant to get stung by them, but they're not life-threatening. It, it's, it's said if you get over 12 stings or something from them, you should seek medical help, but it's not, you know, it's not like, what was it, Hunger Games, where there were like those, those giant wasps that if they stung you, like, game over, man. May the odds ever be in your favor. They're not like that. They're just, you know, Hanging out. But this reminds me of a joke, you guys. Do you know why beekeepers have the prettiest eyes? Oh, sorry. Was there a question before I get into my joke? You can think about the answer to this. Yeah, I was curious. Um, are they a food source for um, any insects? Like, does it work? The hornets? That's a really good question. So, um, I mean, in North America, you know, not yet. But, uh, you know, bears will eat bee larvae along with the... Um, the nectar and everything else, the honey and everything else. So like, like bears will eat yellow jackets and yellow jacket nests and things like that. So I suppose if the bears could get to the nest, they could probably eat them. And I'm not sure, yeah, I didn't look up what eats them back in their native habitat, but um, all these nesting, stinging insects, they don't seem to bother bears. So bears will definitely eat them, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Are, are they, that's a good question. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't read anything about because you would think that they might have stronger effects on like smaller animals. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. And I don't know, I mean, I know dog, do cats get stung by wasps? Our cats never gotten stung, do they? Is that a thing? Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I guess their hair would protect them a little, but you'd think it would affect them more for sure. Yeah, I don't know. So, why do beekeepers have the prettiest eyes? <laughs> That's exactly right. Because beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Exactly. There you go. I had to have a bee joke in there. They do have beautiful eyes, don't they? The bees do as well. Cool. All right. Um, so I'm going to chat about uh, air pollution a little bit today. Let me get that bar out of there, or at least to the side a little more. <laughs> I like it. I'm impressed you guys got the, got the punchline. Anybody have any other jokes that they'd like to, to share? Feel free. Uh, so, you know, we hear stories about different parts of the world sometimes, and it's like, oh, the air is so bad there. It's unhealthy. Um, but, you know, Air pollution is one of those examples of, of chronic exposure where, you know, we might not realize today that the air is not really good for us, but if we breathe it in over years and years and years, it can start to have an impact. And, um, you know, we've done a lot to clean up our environment, and that includes our air and our water, um, but we still see impacts of, of pollution on health even today in the United States. Um, this is a study done a couple years ago um, and it was looking in uh, New York City, right? So an urban area. Uh, so this is related uh, to, to asthma, right? So um, I actually might start with the second point here. Uh, so in these neighborhoods, certain pollutants like nitrogen oxide, dioxide, some things we'll talk about here, 
as well as uh, small particles and, car uh, and some other carbon chemicals, uh, were higher in these neighborhoods that had more uh, asthma cases. So um, basically, um, kids that were living in neighborhoods in New York City that had high levels of these airborne pollutants uh, suffered more from asthma, and that included exercise-induced. So, so growing up, um, this is a, a significant uh, impact. Um, and the, the authors are controlled for other factors that we might think could impact um, the impacts of the environment on your health. Things like access to health care, household income, those kinds of things. Um, even when we look at those things, that wasn't affecting health so much as was the air. So, um, so air quality even now affects people's health. Freezing up here. All right, uh, so just a couple, couple stats on air pollution in, in the US. It's estimated that about half a million people in the US die every year due to essentially heart and lung disease, right? Linked to inhalation of fine particle air pollution. Fine particles are like, uh, like what makes up smoke, essentially. Really tiny particles that are, are um, the product of, uh, of combustion. And generally, the smaller the particles, the more deadly they are because uh, they can get across um, the membranes in your body. So for instance, when particles uh, of um, ash are small enough, they can go directly into your bloodstream from your lungs um, and can cause heart disease. But yeah, so about half a million people each year uh, dying from disease related to breathing in small particles. Um, again, it's interesting how environmental issues intersect. Um, Coal-fired power plants uh, are the largest uh, contributors to both this and then other kinds of pollutants um, as well. Yeah. I think I went to Chicago a couple years ago. That's not gross at all. Oh, sorry. Continue. <laughs> I got like a sinus infection up there. When I came home, for, I might need to like bless. Like, yeah. Packing up my like, pieces after going to Chicago to the airport. The Windy City. The Windy City. What's in the wind? Yeah. When um when we were in Kathmandu. In, in Nepal, back when I was in the Peace Corps, um, people would wear masks. Actually, it's kind of funny. Probably the last time I wore a mask before COVID. People would wear like mostly like the white, like uh, kind of medical kind of masks. People would wear those. And yeah, and you'd walk around all day, and then you'd look at like the mask on the outside of it at the end of the day, and it'd be like brown. And you're like, ugh, like that would have been in my lungs if I hadn't been wearing a mask. Yeah, yeah. Um, so anyway, it's a problem. A couple things here. Uh, and interestingly enough, Southern California, um, particularly LA, because of some of the ways that the, um, they get what's called a, a thermal inversion in the, in the valley there in LA, it has, has particularly bad air. But it's interesting here because we think about like energy, right? And we, we want renewable energy for you know, environmental reasons and to help stem climate change and those kinds of things. But, um, but you know, Burning coal is, is, is a problem for other reasons as well, uh, including contributions to air pollution that we'll breathe in. Um, all right, so uh, just a couple vocabulary um, terms to get through here. Uh, so we can talk about point and non-point sources of pollution. Um, how would we define point sources? Any thoughts? So that's a good example. Uh huh. Factor is a good example. And as far as defining it goes, it's it's just a specific spot that emits a large amount of pollution. And I know that's kind of a kind of a vague definition there. But um, you know, yeah, factories are the clearest example of this. Like an example, you know, where where we have a, a certain location that's. Um, producing a lot of, of pollutants. So one example is a, was a, is a factory. Any other examples come to mind? <laughs> volcano. Yeah, volcanoes are interesting. That, that, would, that would be like a one-time point source, I suppose. 
right? Because they do emit a lot of different chemicals that are toxic to us. So yeah, that's an example, I guess, of like a, a one-time point source. And we contrast that with, with non-point sources. And the way we think of a non-point source is that it's more diffuse, right? So it's, if we talk about non-point pollution, we're talking about a lot of small sources. So like a lot of small points of pollution making that up. Any examples of non-point pollution source? Sorry, there was a question back there, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and so, so you might think, well, isn't a car like a point source of pollution? But because the amount of pollution that the car produces is relatively small, then, um, you know, you get something like a, a freeway, all those cars together form an example of non-point pollution. And so, you know, air quality, things like carbon monoxide and mercury is a lot higher near uh, roads than further away. Um, yeah, so like a road and interstate is an example of a, of a non-point pollution source. Which do you think is easier to manage, point, so, point source or non-point source? Point source is easier, yeah, absolutely, right? Because if you know there's a factory that's producing a lot of pollutants, you can work with that factory uh, to put filters in place or other things, and you can directly reduce the pollution. But if you want to do something about air pollution from an interstate, it's more complicated, right? You're going to have to think about like statewide emissions laws, things like that, vehicle inspections. It gets a lot more complicated. So in general, point sources are easier uh, to work with. And I think I mentioned this earlier, but um, kind of like in our country's history of environmental legislation, we're pretty good now at regulating point source pollutants. We're pretty good. Most of the issues we see now are more related to non-point. And that goes for both air pollution and water pollution. With water pollution, um, sometimes you hear about like an E. coli level in a river that's too high or something like that. That happens when it rains, right? And it washes things in from the surrounding landscape. So non-point sources are really what we're working the most to regulate now, um, both with water and air pollution. Okay. Two other terms to define for you and contrast here. We can talk about primary pollutants and secondary pollutants. So primary pollutants uh, are chemicals that are uh, released directly into the atmosphere by, by the pollution source. Uh, a couple examples here. These are people dressed up as carbon dioxide molecules. It's complicated. Um, so carbon dioxide goes straight up into the atmosphere. Also, particulate matter, like ash, essentially any, you know, like when you're at the campfire and you burn in the wood and the smoke is going up, like what's in that smoke is basically uh, particulate matter, right? It's tiny little pieces of, of, of carbon, right, that have been, been burned and now they're tiny enough that the air is carrying them up. So. An example is of, of something like that is very fine particulate matter. So any place where we're burning things, uh, we're going to produce some uh, particulate matter. And then we can break it down into different sizes. Uh, this is a, a category of, uh, this is a technical term, very fine particulate matter. This is a, um, the cross section of a human hair, the circle here. And then these pieces of particulate matter. So it gives you an idea about the size of them. And as I was saying, those are problematic because when they get small enough, um, they go directly across the epithelial tissue in your lungs into the capillaries and can move into your, your bloodstream. Okay, so primary pollutants. These are things that go directly into the air. Uh, secondary pollutants, on the other hand, are things that are pollutants in the atmosphere, but they're the product of a reaction that happened in the atmosphere. So. It's essentially a primary pollutant that's reacted with something in the atmosphere. Can anybody think of any examples of a secondary pollutant? Anybody know of any secondary air pollutants? Ozone. Ozone, uh-huh, yeah. Ozone is an example, uh-huh. Anything else?
so there's, there's several of these, but um, the example with ozone, this happens when um, a whole bunch of different chemicals, a whole bunch of different organic gases react with ultraviolet radiation in the atmosphere. And that converts them into ozone. And ozone is three oxygen molecules stuck together. So oxygen normally lives its life as, you know, two oxygen molecules together. But when there is enough energy, it locks them in as three oxygens in a triangle. And that's, that's ozone. And we'll talk in just a second about why uh, it's problematic. Um, but another one is nitric and sulfuric acid. If you've heard of acid rain, that's what's going on here. Um, so when uh, nitric oxides and sulfuric oxides get released into the atmosphere, they react with water droplets in the atmosphere um, to form acid, right, which then falls, um, falls back down to Earth. <clears throat> So let's look at what are the main primary air pollutants in the US that we're concerned about. Um, and so you don't need to get all these details, but just know that carbon monoxide is by far the most abundant primary air pollutant in our atmosphere. Where does carbon monoxide come from? Any thoughts? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, it comes from fossil fuel combustion, and so combustion of octane, right, which is what we burn in our cars, will produce it. Yeah. So carbon monoxide is, is the, the biggest primary pollutant. What's, what's, the, what's the second biggest, based on, this, on, on these data, which come from the EPA? Particulates, yeah. So that's, again, think of that as like smoke, right? So like burning coal, burning wood, all that kind of thing. It's mostly coals that it comes from, right? So particulates are um, the second most abundant primary pollutant in the atmosphere. But really, uh, carbon monoxide is, is, is the biggest piece. Um, so as was mentioned, when we think about where those pollutants are coming from, if we think of you know, carbon monoxide coming from, um, from vehicles, it kind of makes sense that um, more than half of our primary pollutants in the atmosphere are coming uh, from, from transportation. So, um, and then this other fuel combustion is like fuel combustion in other settings, like industrial, um, that sort of thing. Um, and then these are like production processes, like chemicals that are reacted in industrial processes and things. But really, I think it's important to notice just like, you know, when we're burning fuel for transportation, that's the majority now of our outdoor air pollution. So when you're riding your bike, you're doing your part to reduce air pollution. When you're taking the bus, when you're carpooling with a friend, although that's a little more challenging now, right? When you're walking around outside. So the transportation sector actually contributes the most um, to outdoor air pollution uh, in the States. <clears throat> All right. Uh, so let's think a little bit about how air pollution affects our health. What do you think it does to our health when we're breathing in these pollutants, these carbon monoxides, these particulates? Why might that be bad for us? Any thoughts? How does it affect our body? Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah. And so. Ozone, yeah, it's actually, it's, yeah, it's an irritant as well. Yeah, so um, it's going to produce, it's going to irritate our lungs. It's going to cause things like asthma. Um, and that's, that's sort of a general catch-all thing. You don't try to write all these down. Wait till it comes out on video, which will be probably later today. Um, but... Just looking at some of these pollutants, like particulate matter, nitrogen oxide, sulfur oxides, carbon monoxide, ozone, all of these are respiratory irritants, right? So if you're living in a place where there's a lot of air pollution going on, it's going to kind of have this cough going on all the time. So most of these are respiratory irritants. 
uh, again, when I was in, in Kathmandu, they had a lot of um, single stroke engines, which are real inefficient, like lawnmower engines. And they produce a lot of smoke, a lot of pollution. And we used to call it the Kathmandu cough. Like when you've been in Kathmandu for a couple of weeks, you just kind of get a cough from breathing in all this smoke. Um, but as I mentioned, uh, some of these are, um, are linked to heart disease as well. So just kind of know that these are all respiratory irritants. Um, and that given enough time, uh, they can develop into further um, health problems. I mean, suppressing your immune system, like anything that stresses you, right, can suppress your immune system. So breathing in these air pollutants can do that. Carbon monoxide is especially dangerous, though, because, you know, your blood has hemoglobin, right, which grabs oxygen molecules and moves, moves them throughout your body, and then grabs CO2 and moves it back to your lungs. Well, the hemoglobin in your body has a higher affinity for carbon monoxide than it does for oxygen. So what happens when you breathe in a lot of carbon monoxide is that your blood doesn't take the oxygen where it needs it to go. It grabs carbon monoxide instead. And so, um, yeah, so you can essentially like, like pass out and, and die, right, from carbon monoxide poisoning. Um, but yeah, so just know like, any of these air pollutants are going to be sort of irritants, kind of leading to that cough. But then if you have um, uh, some more chronic exposure, then it can lead uh, to some of these more serious things like heart disease, immune system suppression, all those sorts of things. <clears throat> all right. So there's six different major classes of air pollutants that the EPA um, is involved in regulating. So particulate matter we've talked about already. Uh, nitrogen oxides and sulfur oxides, um, these are going to come, again, mostly from combustion. Nowadays, it's mostly from burning coal, but we get some from burning uh, fuels in our, ga our cars as well. Um, the carbon oxides we talked about some hydrocarbons, and then ozone. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk about each of these. But there's a reason that I've shaded four of those green. Any idea why? <laughs> yeah, that could have been it. I could have highlighted them because they're like green in like a friendly, happy green kind of way. Uh, but I actually shaded them because they're greenhouse gases, these four here. So nitrogen oxides, carbon oxides, hydrocarbons, and ozone are also greenhouse gases, which means that they, um, they keep the Earth's heat from radiating back out to space. And they keep the Earth warmer than it would be without them. Um, so is there a question? Or? Uh, I'll oh, yeah. Okay. Right on. And these two here, as we mentioned, uh, are most important, really, because of the secondary pollutants that they become. So they can react uh, with water in the atmosphere and create acid rain. So nitrogen oxides react in the atmosphere uh, to produce nitric acid, sulfur oxides, wrapped in the atmosphere to produce sulfuric acid. <clears throat> yeah, so that, that, is, that can be important too, yeah. And um, I'm going to mention that in just a second. And that's, yeah, it's kind of a weird one in the sense that it's carbon dioxide reacting with water. And carbon dioxide is really interesting because it has so many natural sources in addition to anthropogenic sources. Um, yeah, so these two important for uh, creating acid rain, and yeah, some carbon oxides, but we'll talk about that in a second. Cool. Um, so here's a map of the pH of precipitation across the U.S. Um, so the darkest green here is pH that's 5.3 or greater. I apologize if you can't see this in the back there. Um, so, 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 so what, what, what pH is neutral again? Seven, right? Yeah, so when we look at, at pH of precipitation across the US, 
even this highest uh, category of high pH is still slightly acidic, right? So the lower our pH goes, the more acidic it is. And um, so it turns out that all rainwater is at least slightly acidic because of CO2 in the atmosphere. So the CO2 reacts with um, water uh, to produce carbonic acid, which is a real weak acid. So the rainwater, even if people didn't do anything to it, would be slightly acidic just because of natural processes. But as you can see, there are some parts of the country where the rain gets quite acidic, down below four, which, you know, each, each unit that you move down in the pH scale is a factor of 10, right? So it's a log scale. So that, so that means four is 10 times as acidic as five, which is 10 times as acidic as six. So where is most of the acidic rain in the US, with the red being more acidic? Mostly to the east, uh-huh. It correlates pretty well with, with population density. And it turns out that the areas that have really high levels of acidification uh, are downwind of um, sources of pollution, primarily um, coal-burning power plants, so what produce the most sulfur oxides and nitrogen oxides now. So when we see these little hot spots, like this one here in East Texas, uh, actually I actually have, have a colleague at uh, TCU who does research on, on acid rain. And so this is downwind uh, of, um, of some power plants that produce uh, electricity for Dallas. So, um, so we have these kind of localized hot spots of acid rain that are downwind from um, areas of lots of coal burning power plants. Anybody ever hiked on Mount Mitchell? If you haven't, and you have a chance, go do it. It's pretty cool. Um, but yeah, you know, when you look at intro to environmental science textbooks, a lot of them will actually have Mount Mitchell as an example of what acid precipitation can do. Um, because we're actually downwind uh, from Tennessee, it turns out. And um, it was interesting, the state of North Carolina actually sued the state of Tennessee to reduce uh, emissions from their coal burning power plants because they were producing so many sulfur and nitrogen oxides that the acid rain was blowing into North Carolina and causing problems. And that's what happened at Mount Mitchell uh, and is happening. And so in the mist in Mount Mitchell, people have recorded pHs as low as two. Uh, so that's like, that's like grapefruit juice, right? That's, that's pretty strong acid. So those of y'all that were at Mount Mitchell, did, did you notice anything about the trees there? Any trees that's like missing? I mean, it's kind of high elevations and more evergreens, but evergreens are like missing needles and that kind of thing. Yeah, they look kind of sad. And there's a lot going on in Mount Mitchell. There are other problems too, but um, yeah. But when you have acidic rain, the plants can't photosynthesize anymore. It messes with the leaves' ability. And then it gets into the soil, and it makes the soil too acidic uh, to live in as well. So um, a lot of the pine trees in Mount Mitchell have been hit pretty hard with this. Um, but suffice to say, North Carolina won its court case. Uh, and so Tennessee was required by the federal government to reduce emissions from its coal-burning power plants. Um, yeah, question. You know, that's a really good question. I, I, I'm unaware of anything that they're doing in the soil. In places where um, streams are affected by acid rain, they will actually pour um, calcium carbonate, like crushed limestone. They'll actually pour that into streams to neutralize them. In fact, um, Dr. Russell, who's uh, our department chair, um, she did a dissertation research up in the Adirondack Mountains in New York uh, studying how um, treatment for acid rain affected the plant community. So, um, yeah, so I, I, I'd have to look it up. I'm not aware of anything they're doing now. They may have done stuff back in the day, but nothing right now that I know of. 
that's one of the crazy things about nature. It's like if you, if you just kind of like remove the stressor, like nature can recover in an amazing way a lot of times. Um, for instance, uh, the French Broad River used to be really polluted uh, and it's been getting cleaner and cleaner. And so we're finding new fish species in the French Broad River now that didn't used to be there before because they've migrated upstream as the water's gotten cleaner. And so with acid rain, um, you know, it may be that some of these trees do fine. Now, the problem would be the soil. The soil would still be what it is. So, All right, so ozone. Talk a little bit more about ozone. Ozone is also, as I mentioned, a secondary pollutant. So it's uh, the product of um, a whole set of chemicals called chlor... Um, well, back up, sorry. What creates these are hydrocarbons that, uh, that are, are, um, are altered, have the structure altered by UV radiation. But ozone is a Jekyll and the Hyde, the Dr. Jekyll, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde of air pollution because when ozone is near the Earth in what's called the troposphere, right, the lowest layer of the atmosphere, it's an air pollutant. It causes problems. But when it's at the highest level of the atmosphere up in the stratosphere, it protects us, and we need it. So the ozone accumulates in the stratosphere, the highest level of the atmosphere, and it creates like a shield against UV radiation. I mean, essentially, what it, it, it absorbs the radiation, basically, and breaks into oxygen. But we've been losing the ozone layer. You might have heard of like the hole in the ozone layer. We've been losing ozone molecules because there are other chemicals that are emitted into the air as pollutants, which react with ozone and, uh, and break it down. So those are what are known as chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs. You might have heard of them. CFCs are an example of uh, a free radical. Anybody ever heard of a free radical before? Yeah, they're Yeah, yeah, and they're, they're bad, like if you have them in your diet, right? They're bad, they can mutate your DNA and cause cancer, they're pretty bad. Um, yeah. Is chlorine a free radical? Oh, so, yeah, well, so chlorofluorocarbons, yeah, they're specific, like, carbon molecules that have chlorine and fluorine connected to them, and I don't, I don't know all the chemistry of how that happens, but, um, yeah, but there's a whole, like, suite of them. But the thing, the thing about these chemicals, though, is, like, they were only made by people. They don't exist naturally, these chlorofluorocarbons. They only, only exist, like, if they're in the earth, they've been made by people, basically, yeah. Um, Yeah, so, so ozone, we talked about it being a pollutant, and it is when it's down near the Earth's surface. But when it's up in the stratosphere, it's super duper important because it protects us from UV radiation. This is a schematic, or a schematic, it's a, an image of the Earth um, showing the concentration of ozone molecules. And so the purple is lowest. And if you can see, right, so this is the, the southern hemisphere that we're looking at here, the southern hemisphere. Um, so the ozone concentrations have been greatly depleted, creating this hole in the ozone layer near Antarctica. So what that means is that when the sun shines here in the southern hemisphere, there's more UV radiation that makes it to Earth. And it's interesting, like, people that live in Australia and New Zealand that enjoy the outdoors, they take it pretty seriously when it comes to protecting themselves from the sun's rays. Like, when I was in Oklahoma, I was working with a guy who um, was from Australia, and he'd always, have you guys ever seen those French Foreign Legion hats? They're like ball caps, but they've got like these, like, strips behind them to protect your neck. Like, he'd always wear those. And, um, so people that live in the Southern Hemisphere, 
deal with more UV radiation than we do. Uh, all right, yeah. So this ozone layer protects us from UV radiation in the stratosphere. There's chlorofluorocarbons and then some other chemicals uh, react with ozone. So O3 is ozone, right? Um, and make it O2. And again, I couldn't sketch out the chemistry for you there. <clears throat> okay, so we knew these CFCs were bad because they were breaking down ozone and causing this ozone hole. Uh, but this is uh, kind of some good news. So countries around the world got together and said, we need to stop producing these CFCs because um, they're causing this, this, this global problem. So there's, there was this agreement called the Montreal Protocol in 1987. And those were the countries of the world who came together and said, uh, we're not going to make CFCs anymore. What were CFCs used for, you might ask? Well, I'm glad you asked. Um, they were used as propellants in spray cans, aerosol spray cans. They were used as uh, coolants, and like air conditioning units, those kinds of things. Uh, so basically what happened was folks did research and they found different chemicals that they could use as propellants in aerosol spray cans and different chemicals they could use for, um, for coolants. So it's kind of a nice coming together. Folks found other chemicals that they could use uh, for these CFCs and so they didn't need to make them as much. Um, yeah. That's exactly why. I know, I like to make a joke about like, you know, like the 80s caused the ozone hole because if you've seen like hairstyles in the 80s or like hair doing all kinds of crazy things that hair was not like normally made to do and it's like hairspray everywhere. Yes, I was a child of the 80s. Yes, those were like my teenage years. Lots of strange, strange hairdos among other things. Yep, exactly. So hairspray was one of those aerosols that they found other propellants to use now. So. Um, don't need CFCs. So, yeah, so this is kind of nice. I mean, I think it just shows like, um, you know, when we get together and uh, decide on a common goal, uh, we can get things done. And it was kind of a nice um, situation because technology was able to find other chemicals we could use as propellant, so it worked out well. Uh, yeah, so since 1987, uh, the amount of CFCs produced globally has been dropping uh, pretty rapidly. Uh, you know, it didn't just stop instantly, um, but it's been being phased out. So people like to point to this as like an example of like an international treaty that, that kind of helped solve this problem. And data on the ozone layer nowadays actually shows that it's doing okay. It's starting to come back actually, which is great. Um, anyway, I, I just found some, so just found some data on the atmospheric concentrations because it takes a little time, right? So if we stop making this stuff today, you know, it's still going to be in the atmosphere for a while. Um, so I don't know, these are data showing that the amount in the atmosphere was going up and up and up and up until the Montreal Protocol, right? And then, it, you know, again, it's still in the atmosphere, but slowly declining. So we stopped the increase, which was awesome. It'd be really cool to see something like that happen with CO2, right? <laughs> So, uh, so anyway, so this kind of holds out hope for people that are like, oh, you're not going to solve those environmental problems. Well, we have a history of doing <clears throat> Cool. Um, so the legislation that addresses clean air, if you remember, clean air was one of the very first thing, one of the, was one of the very first things that we addressed in that whole wave of environmental legislation that started in the early 70s. And so the Clean Air Act first came down the pipe in 1970 and then was, was um, sort of amended and revised in 1990. And so uh, the way it works, and it still works this way, is that um, it sets standards for air quality. So for each of those pollutants that we mentioned earlier, there are like maximum allowable levels or standards. Uh, and then it has limits on uh, particularly uh, point source emissions, right? And then 
both the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act uh, have provisions in there uh, to fund uh, research, right? So for example, with CFCs, folks realized they were bad, but they didn't know what else you could use. So someone had to figure out, well, what other chemicals can we use, right? As these coolants and these propellants. So it has some funds in there uh, to do research. So one of the things, so the Environmental Protection Agency administers the Clean Air Act, just like the Clean Water Act. And one of the things the EPA does is they, they, they do research on these different topics. A lot of environmental legislation is really interesting. It's what's called um, citizen-driven. So what that means is that if there's pollution, if there's air pollution going on in your neighborhood, don't wait for someone from the government to come and test it and find the problem. The way that most of the testing, most of the intensive testing works, is that citizens sue the EPA and say, this air doesn't meet the standards for air quality that you've put in place. And once that happens, then the EPA will come and test in more detail. They're required to. It's really interesting. The Clean Air Act works this way. The Clean Water Act works this way. Even the Endangered Species Act works this way. If there's a species that's getting really rare, the way that it gets protection under the Endangered Species Act is somebody has to sue the Fish and Wildlife Service and say, this species is threatened with extinction. It needs to be on the endangered species list. And then they're required to, uh, to address that, to, like, to check it out, basically. So um, yeah, so if folks feel that their air quality is not, what it is, is not meeting these standards, then they sue the EPA, and then they come and, and check it out. And so, and so that's basically how it works, essentially, right? Um, and, uh, you know, and then depending on what is found when there are uh, standards violations, um, then th they can come and investigate the factory things, investigate sources. Okay. So then in 1990, we went back and said, okay, like we need to revise this um, in light of what's really threatening air quality nowadays. And so 1990 uh, was when auto emissions became a real big thing. You know, when you ever go to get your car inspected, right, they do an emissions test. They look at uh, nitrogen, sulfur, things like that, and see what the levels are like. So 1990, went back, looked at auto emissions, toxic air pollutants, were, there was just some more that they added. Uh, but then again, it took a closer look. So we'd identified auto emissions as an air pollution issue. Acid deposition, that's acid rain. So it took a harder look at sulfur oxides and nitrogen oxides. Um, and again, this, this was right after the, um, the Montreal Protocol. So we were still thinking a lot about the ozone layer. And so ozone depletion was, um, was a focus there as well. It also introduced, do you remember back in the day, feels like a long time ago, we were talking about environmental policy and we talked about how you can have um, a cap and trade system. Go back, watch that video. It's, it's excellent. It's one of my better videos. Uh, <laughs> see, this is cool because I used to be like, well, look back in your notes and check out, you know, check out our YouTube video. Um, so it also introduced emissions trading. And um, this was for several different pollutants. And this, just had, this, this was the idea, again, there, that you'd have to buy uh, permits to pollute if you're an industry. And then you could, you could trade with the idea being that you create like an economic incentive to not pollute much. Cool. Um, all right. So there are six pollutants that the EPA is keeping an eye out, out for. They're the ones that we just mentioned earlier, but I'll give you a chance to, to jot them down. So carbon monoxide, again, from vehicle emissions, any kind of fuel combustion. And then sulfur and uh, nitrogen uh, dioxides. 
It turns out that sulfur and nitrogen um, are found in coal, naturally. So that when you burn them, uh, when you burn coal, you're not just burning carbon, you're burning sulfur and nitrogen compounds as well as so that goes in the atmosphere. Same thing with, with crude oil, which is why the, it's in our, our automobile fuel, right? Fourth one is, is tropospheric ozone. So again, we're not concerned about ozone. Well, we want ozone up in the stratosphere. But when we have ozone down in the troposphere, the troposphere, again, is that layer of the atmosphere that's closest uh, to the Earth's surface. So tropospheric ozone. Uh, particulate matter, again, that's the smoke, right, those little particles. Particulate matter could be anything, but really it's, it's, it's um, little pieces of carbon, essentially. And then the final one we haven't mentioned yet was lead. Anybody ever watch the, um, the TV series Cosmos? I love that. I, I hope it's still on Netflix. It's narrated by uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. And they have an episode on lead. It's, I don't know, if we have a free class, we should watch it or something. But so lead, anybody know what, where lead came from? Why were we concerned about lead in the environment? Where was it coming from? So, so right, yeah, that can be a source of lead in our drinking water, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I guess I was thinking more in the air, but yeah, with water, absolutely, it can be from our pipes, yeah. What is gasoline? Yeah, so when I was a kid, and we went on a trip, we'd pull up our station wagon into the gas station, and, well, first of all, what's kind of weird is people would come out and, like, pump the gas for you, like, that doesn't happen anymore, but... When they come up to your car, they'd say, do you want leaded or unleaded gasoline? That was the thing, because gasoline needs to always have lead in it. It helped engines run smoothly. Uh, but leaded gasoline was phased out, but there was a while where some cars ran on leaded, some cars ran on unleaded. Yeah, so now imagine, right? Like, think of all the cars. Like, I don't know, just, just like stand near an intersection sometime, you know, act normally while you're doing this. And, just like look at like all the cars driving by and like think like out of every exhaust pipe is coming like the fumes of like the gas that they're burning, right? And so all those cars were burning fuel and putting lead into the atmosphere. And so we can now find lead in uh, the ice in the North Pole and the South Pole. Not because ice naturally contains lead, but because we put so much of it into the atmosphere from our vehicles that it got blown everywhere. Kind of like the PCBs and the salmon, right? Got into the atmosphere, it gets everywhere. Yeah, so um, lead. Lead also is, uh, used to be used in, in paint, some of you may know. So up until the 70s, um, paint contained lead. Supposedly it made it nice and smooth and stuff. I don't know. So if you're ever like stripping old paint off of a house, um, you need to be aware of that and wear like a respirator and all this stuff and don't get the paint chips down into the ground where you're going to plant a garden and stuff like that. So these are the six. These are the six that the EPA is, is most concerned about. Um, and so this is uh, just a map showing uh, counties. So this is done on a county by county basis. And uh, so counties in green didn't meet standards for one of those pollutants. Counties in blue for two. Yellow is three. And then red <laughs> meant that they didn't meet standards for all six of those, <laughs> which is pretty bad. Um, all right, geography buffs. What's here in Arizona? Is this Tucson or Phoenix? It's got to be one of the two. The red there, anybody know? Someone, someone look up real quickly. I want to know. I want to know what city it is that has like the worst air quality. I want to say Phoenix. Phoenix a little further over this way. So is it, is it Tucson maybe? Don't you love it when I ask you questions that you feel like I should know the answers to? <laughs> <laughs> All 
Well, anyway, just looking across this map, where would you say the poorest air quality is in the US? To the west, right? Sorry. Several of you said something, but I was unable to understand. You'd think I'd be able to like understand people really clearly from them in their masks from like listening for like so many months. Uh-uh. Doesn't doesn't work for me. Yeah, so out west is the is 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 the worst air quality, particularly Southern California and wherever that place is in Arizona. Anybody figure that out yet? Tucson? Tucson? Okay, Tucson, Arizona. If you're going there, be careful. Keep your masks on. Maybe that mask's on already. Although this probably won't filter out ozone. <laughs> um, well, it turns out there, there's one pollutant that in Buncombe County sometimes we have a problem with. Um, anybody want to guess which one it is? Do you say algae? Yeah, so there are so there's definitely water issues with algae sometimes from the North Fork Reservoir where Asheville gets its water supply. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, so I was asking about like like these air pollutants, like which one? Although maybe algae does get in the air. I don't know. Never thought about that. Um, turns out that we sometimes have trouble with ozone in Buncombe County, because we're in a valley. And so what happens is, you know, you've got a lot of cars driving around, producing um, um, floor, um, just carbon, hydrocarbons. And then they, hit, they, get, they get hit with, um, with UV radiation. So any place where you have a valley, it allows air pollution to accumulate in some cases. And so um, we have trouble with um, ozone sometimes. Not all of them, but sometimes. OK. Uh, again, another little success story. I try to leave you guys with you know success stories whenever I can. Uh, but lead is another great example of a pollutant that we worked real hard on and have reduced in our environment to a great extent. Uh, so these are three, three panels looking at lead concentrations on our y-axis and then years on the x. And so this is um, lead levels in the soil. You can see it's about a third by 1980, it was about a third of what it was in 1975. Lead consumed in gasoline, of course, dropped precipitously and has now got to be close to zero. And the amount of, of lead in people's blood uh, dropped as well. You can go take a scoop of it, take it to the chemistry lab, you'll find lead in it. Like, it's just, it's everywhere. It just is out in the environment. But less of it than there used to be. <clears throat> So do you all remember, we asked a question at the beginning of class, what percentage of time does the average American spend indoors? Do you remember what it was? Yeah, good, it's about 90%. So you might ask yourself, well, really, shouldn't we be thinking about indoor air quality even more than outdoor air quality, right? Because uh, in general, indoor air quality, indoor, indoor air contains higher concentrations of pollutants than outdoor air. And we, we've certainly learned this with COVID, right? That um, I actually should share this, this data with you. It's an interesting article that looked at um, rates of spread indoor versus outdoor, much, much higher rates indoors. So should we be having class outdoors? I don't know, maybe. Um, but we have to be more careful indoors. Just because the air is recirculated, it's not moving as much, right? So indoor air uh, has higher levels of all these pollutants, well, in general, how higher concentrations of pollutants than outdoor air. And like the different importance of indoor pollutants depends on where you are in the world. So for instance, um, if you're living in India or Nepal, where I lived for a while, uh, you have different chemicals to worry about indoors than we have to worry about here um, in the States. What do you think the most important air pollute, indoor air pollutants are um, here in the States? Any thoughts? Carbon monoxide, formaldehyde. Yeah, so carbon monoxide we kind of kind of mentioned. Um, these are actually the ones that cause the most health issues. Tobacco smoke, man, it's crazy. I'll tell you, gosh, just learning about. Um, yeah, so t tobacco smoke has lots of stuff in it. It's not good for you. Radon is an interesting one. Radon is produced by, um, it's a product when you have like radioactive rock. 
rock that's very weakly radioactive. We have a lot of that here, actually. So in our basement, we have like a, a system that like blows air out of the basement. It's dangerous. And then the formaldehyde that was mentioned, these are what are known as volatile organic compounds. You know that new car smell? That smell is volatile organic compounds. They're all these chemicals that we use to make things, like to make rugs, to make the material in, in, in your car cushions and all that kind of stuff. All those are going to give off chemicals, volatile organic compounds, or VOCs. Um, after they, they, they remodeled our, our part of, the, of, the, um, of Rhodes Robinson Hall, and after they did, it just it, it smelled like just carpet, and it was, it was so bad, and we couldn't open the windows. It was bad. It was very bad. Um, so anyway, so, so these are, are mostly what we're dealing with uh, today. Uh, sick building syndrome, it can actually get to the point indoors where um, you get um, pathogens that get established in the ventilation systems. Um, and so sick building system syndrome can actually happen where you, you get indoor air pollution that's, that, that, that's so bad that in some uh, instances they've actually had to take the whole building down. This is um, black mold. So if black mold gets established in the ventilation system, you just can't. Um, there's not much you can do, not much you can do. The, the spores get everywhere, right? But so mildew, black mold, even disease pathogens as well can get established. And so this, this can be a problem. So sick building syndrome happens when you get um, establishment of, the, of um, get air quality that really can't be, um, can't be fixed, can't be fixed. <clears throat> So all of this should make you all want to go outside. Is that something that can happen if a ventilation system is just left to sit for a really long time? Or That's a good question. I, I would assume that that is one of the things that leads to it. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure, Jay. I mean, you would think, uh, I would assume that keeping it, you know, that if you don't have it running, stuff could accumulate in there. We're, we actually had a problem in, um, in the Humanities Lecture Hall a few years ago, and they, they went in and they replaced all the rugs and all the upholstery of all the seats, and like, I don't know if they redid or just cleaned out the ventilation systems, because that had gotten some, I think it was maybe mildew in there, so it was closed for like months, and they had to go in and do all that. So yeah. So all this should make you want to go outside and get some fresh air. And you're in luck, because now we're done. So you can go outside and get some fresh air. Any questions?